Tim Garfield had called before dropping in on Mary Elizabeth Jones, but she had not picked up the cell. He was in the area, and he had some cash on him, and he wanted to put Mary Elizabeth Jones on a back burner so he could devote his attention to David Hunter Duncan and his new problem. David Hunter Duncan was not predictable. He might try to bust his son out of jail with a pellet gun. He could go from smart to stupid about as fast as anyone Jim Garfield had ever met. Jim Garfield pulled in front of Mary Elizabeth Jones's house. Something was amiss. Mary Elizabeth Jones would have ordinarily picked up her cell because she knew he didn't call to discuss the weather. Jim Garfield only called for good reasons, and today that reason was cash. Maybe she had a new boyfriend. Mary Elizabeth Jones had grown cautious with men with the arrival of two babies. There were only two fathers of her sons, and Ulysses, the door opened before Jim Garfield could ring the bell. There stood his former community supervisor, Ulysses Grant Johnson, a man once regarded as a criminal genius, but later thought of as a nutcase. He was slightly heavier, and he still had a crazy affect, but now it was a different crazy affect. He looked sadder, if not wiser. Last time I saw you, you had Christmas lights in your hair, Jim Garfield stated matter-of-factly. You were quite the trendsetter. I was a trendsetter. I am a trendsetter. I will always be a trendsetter. And that declaration set off a pressured monologue that featured a litany of pop singers who had stolen his Christmas lights and the hair thing from Ulysses Grant Johnson. And Ulysses shifted the focus to other aspects of his sartorial history. He admitted that it had been a mistake to wear a robe and a translucent crown of thorns while working as a Harris County probation officer because the masses weren't ready for it, but he defended his decision to wear an ankle-length purple cape and matching beret. Jim Garfield briefly considered his memory of Ulysses. He always had darting eyes and was always eccentric, but it was a subtle eccentricity. He would not have recruited seasoned criminals to work for him had he not offered a stable presence. His crack-up was sudden and severe, and a lot of serious cons found themselves taking instructions from a runaway circus clown. Without hesitating, Ulysses recited his recent history in turbo mode. He had gone from functionally crazy to over-the-top crazy. Ulysses thought that if he acted super crazy, then people would think he was faking his lunacy because no one could be that bizarre without trying. Ulysses skipped a few chapters and explained that he had agreed to let his father become his guardian ad litem because it was only for one year. He stated that his father extended the arrangement an extra year without his knowledge, but then his father had a stroke, and if push came to shove, Ulysses could get a lawyer and contest the extension because it had been done illegally. And his father had sent Ulysses away to a mission in the, the Cayman Islands and had sent Ulysses' fiance, Courtney Winston, who stayed in separate quarters, of course. But Courtney didn't want to marry no nut job, and she returned home broke off the marriage. Next thing you knew, Ulysses was in a private facility in Arkansas, run by B.F. Skinner on acid. They lock Ulysses in a padded cell with no clocks and no windows and no human contact. Food and toothpaste and paper cups were sent in by a lazy Susan so that the attendant's faces could not be seen. Trash was thrown down one chute, and dirty laundry was thrown down another. After what Ulysses estimated to be a week, a figure came on screen and started talking to him. Ulysses would later learn that this image was Kelvin Barrow, the BF scanner on acid. Dr. Barrow professed that all mental illness was learned and it could all be resolved with reward and punishment. He also proclaimed that if a mentally ill person adopted the manner and effect of a normal person, they would, for all intents and purposes, be normal. Detailed photos of Ulysses' face were taken with a camera lens inserted through a wall. His style of walking and his handwriting were also recorded. Ulysses was first instructed on how to walk. A di digital recreation of Ulysses' stride was displayed on the wall screen and the ideal ambulation followed. 
As he progressed to a healthy step, Ulysses was rewarded with happy pills and fine chocolate. I didn't feel less crazy. I just felt more white, Ulysses summarized. Next, Ulysses was instructed to write like a sane man. He was given long dictation exercises that emphasized stories of people overcoming mental illness. Then he was subjected to the, the relearning of, a, of handwriting, stroke by stroke. Each rounded lowercase a to the sharp, deliberate strokes of uppercase z. Once each, later, each letter was routinely formed in healthy person cursive, Ulysses was subjected to marathon dictation exercises about the myth of mania and the rational mind. Happy pills and cheeseburgers were supplied with requisite progress. When Ulysses' graphology maintained a normal plateau, the focus turned to his facial expressions. Dr. Barrow had endured harsh criticism for his applied phrenology, but Ulysses was a reluctant convert. As his face projected normal flared eyes and a phase two smile, not phase one or phase three, happy pills rained down and the cuisine improved substantially. Then there was a period of wall screen activity and a copy of Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War was slipped through the lazy Susan. Ulysses had previously refused to read History of the Peloponnesian War because his father had insisted that he read the Greek classic. Now Ulysses read his assigned task with vigor and fervor and was prompted to take a test on the wall screen. He did very well on the test and was rewarded with chips and pretzels and Fritos and Pepsi. Then he was given other books his father had insisted he read, but he had always ignored on principle. Veblen, Sal, Fitzgerald. And when he completed his assigned reading, Ulysses' reading habits were reinforced with the ultimate reward, human contact. His father now came through the wall screen via a webcam in his house. As Ulysses' facial and ambulatory and graphological traits progressed, his father televisited more frequently. I was imprinted on my daddy, Duck, Ulysses explained. I came to see him as the smartest, wisest, lovingest man who ever walked on the earth. But then Senior Johnson had a stroke and was incapacitated. Junior Johnson had never believed in Dr. Barrow and brought Ulysses to his house under heavy medication. There, Ulysses stayed in the basement until he started cheeking the meds and as and was able to devise an exit strategy. So I'm trying to put my old band back together, Ulysses explained. You want to play a few gigs? <laughs>